in Italy, Padre Pio has no rivals. Let me make sure this works. There we go. No other human being, including Jesus and Mary, hangs in as many cars, on as many walls, in as many homes as Padre Pio, or is the subject of as many prayers for intercession. No other site, Christian site in the world, aside from the Vatican, Guadalupe, Lourdes, and Jerusalem, is visited on pilgrimage as much as San Giovanni Rotundo, where the tomb of Padre Pio is. And in terms of remarkable stories, perhaps there too, Padre Pio has no rivals. And I'm sure a lot of you know these stories even better than I do. They range from the seemingly ridiculous to the impossible to ignore. For example, the flying monk stories seem to verge closest maybe on the ridiculous. Padre Pio had predicted that San Giovanni Rotunda would be untouched by Allied bombings during World War II. He was correct. But the reason that some people gave for why San Giovanni Rotunda was spared is quite remarkable. Dr. Sanguinetti, one of Padre Pio's closest friends, recounts the story to a Dominican who wrote it up, a Dominican who is actually known for being extremely objective in his stories about Padre Pio. He tells the story of an American Protestant general, Bernardo Rossini, who had decided a bombing raid on San Giovanni Rotundo because he had heard there was a German munitions dump there. While they were flying their planes, this general reports to have seen a Capuchin friar flying in the sky next to the bombers, waving him off. <laughs> so he commanded his squadron to drop the bombs in a nearby field and return to base completely stupefied and confused and asked around, <laughs> who had he seen? And someone showed him a picture of Padre Pio and said, maybe, maybe it was this, this monk in San Giovanni Rotundo. And when he was shown the picture, he recognized him and said, yeah, that's the guy I saw. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Car Colonel Curry had a similar experience, American Presbyterian from Ohio, who says that everyone was talking about it and that he too saw a flying monk waving him off. The best of one of Padre Pio's most careful biographers, the best he can make of this story is that they were widely believed by American servicemen and by the people of contemporaries of Padre Pio at the time. And then of course, the stories of bilocation. Bilocation is the miracle of being in two places at the same time. These stories are rather remarkable. I suppose an ability that most mothers wish they had. One of the most incredible and best documented occurred when Padre Pio was only 18 in 1905. I figure we could read this together. This is his own deposition explaining what happened to him. Several days ago, I had an extraordinary experience. This is Pio at the age of 18. Around 11 p.m. on January 18, 1905, Fra Anastasio and I were in the choir when suddenly I found myself far away in a wealthy home where the father was dying while a child was being born. Then the most blessed Virgin Mary appeared to me and said to me, I am entrusting this child to you. I answered, how is this possible since I am still a mere seminarian and I do not know whether I will one day have the fortune and joy of being a priest. And even if I become a priest, how can I take care of this child since I am so far away? The Madonna said, do not doubt, she will come to you, but first you will meet her at St. Peter's in Rome. After that, I found myself again in the choir. About 350 miles to the north, at the exact same time, a wealthy Italian was dying as his wife approached the birth of their first child. At the same time that Padre Pio had his vision, the wife, Leonilda, was kneeling in prayer by the bed of her husband, who was in a coma. She looked up and saw a Franciscan priest, who then disappeared. She ran out into the hallway looking for him, couldn't find him, went into labor, and gave birth to her daughter, Giovanna. Fast forward to 1922, 
when Leonilda had moved her family to Rome, and Giovanna was now 17 years old, and Giovanna went to St. Peter's Basilica, hoping to go to confession. The basilica was closing, and the lines were still long, so the guards were kicking everybody out. And she asked the guard, well, can I go to confession? He said, no, actually, all the priests had left. But then she looked, and a Franciscan was motioning her over to one of the confessionals. So she went into the confessional, had her confession heard, came out, and the guards started yelling at her. I told you to leave. There are no more priests. She said, no, there's a Franciscan right over here. So the guard went in and said, no, there isn't. <laughs> what are you talking about? And, and kicked her out of the basilica. A year later, someone showed her a picture of Padre Pio just talking about this guy, and she said, I went to confession to that guy. So she decided to make a trip down to San Giovanni Rotundo. As she walked up to Padre Pio, he said, Giovanna, I know you. You were born the day that your father died. I've been waiting for you for many years. And she said, perhaps you're mistaken and you've confused me with some other girl. But Padre Pio answered, no, I appeared to your mother at her birth. And then I heard your confession in Rome. Of course, he had never left the monastery that entire time. This is one of the countless well-documented stories of bilocation. And when asked about his bilocation once, Padre Pio answered, quote, I know only that it is God who sends me. I don't know if I'm there in my soul or my body or both. All I can tell you is that I'm always trying to remain attached to the thread of his will. For this reason, I am always wherever I am. <laughs> <laughs> Matteo Ricci might have wanted a little more scientific explanation. <laughs> Even after his death, Padre Pio remains a powerful source of stories of healing and conversion. He was well known throughout his life for giving people short cures, cures that would last a month or two months or a year or two years, just enough time for them to get their lives in order. Of course, there were also complete cures that lasted people's whole lives, but he was also known for these short cures. One man, four years after Padre Pio's death, had terminal cancer. He was lying in bed at home one day in misery when he suddenly began to shout, send that friar away, get him out of my room. He's telling me to go with him, and I don't want to go. <laughs> when he was told there was no one in the room, he said, don't you see him? He told me that he's going to come back for me on the 5th of February. It was November. The man immediately improved. His cancer went away. When he was shown a picture of Padre Pio, he recognized him as the man in the room. For the next two months, he went to Mass and Communion every single day. And then on February 5th, he died peacefully. So why was this man so remarkable? Why Padre Pio? Why did God choose him? That's what so many of his contemporaries wanted to know. <laughs> Padre, uh, Father Gamelli was a brilliant and outspoken priest, physician, and psychologist from Milan. He made a visit to Padre Pio in 1920. According to one biographer, he shared the common northern prejudice toward southern Italians, kind of like certain northerners in the United States share. I know, I'm from New Mexico, so we feel it now and then. <laughs> Cowboy boots and all, you know. Gavelli was very frustrated by his experience of this simple Franciscan. He said, how could a gift so extraordinary as the stigmata be accompanied by so much spiritual poverty, which he meant in a bad way? He decided that Padre Pio was simply a psychopath. Even Pope John, St. John the 23rd, who never met Padre Pio, wrote in his journal in 1960, Quote, I avoided going to San Giovanni Rotundo twice on occasion of my two visits to that area, so that I never knew or was in any way in personal contact with Padre Pio, nor do I remember having taken the occasion to speak or express interest in him with anyone, while I always deplored the mythomania surrounding him. John the 23rd maybe had a slightly negative view of Southern Italy, too, because he hated what he called, quote, the cheap altars where male and female saints are worshipped, unquote. Probably true in many cases. And where the ignorant devotion of the faithful is stirred up to exploit their faith and their money. 
St. John the 23rd secretary, Cardinal Capovia, later said that Pope John had no prejudice toward Padre Pio, but he was constantly bombarded for most of Padre Pio's life with really bad information about Padre Pio. In 1960, the Vatican sent Monsignor Mercari to make an apostolic visitation. He was completely turned off by the pandemonium at Padre Pio's masses, local people and, and, and people from all over Italy just fighting and clawing and stabbing their way to the front to get close to Padre Pio. He complained of Padre Pio's lack of education because of his, quote, southern origins and couldn't understand why such a deficient instrument could be so popular. So he concluded, he's just a clever peasant. He can't be a saint. He's not even a worthy priest. Now, I say these things for the sake of Fultz's disclosure because... I felt sort of the same when I was asked to give this talk. Honestly, I've never really liked Padre Pio that much. <laughs> so when Dr. Cavadini asked me to talk about him, I said, well, okay. <laughs> what he didn't know is that I've actually been to San Giovanni Rotundo back in 2001. I was traveling, I was doing a semester abroad in Austria and traveling around Italy for 10 days on a break, and we started at Assisi, where I was profoundly moved by the experience of St. Francis and visiting, you know, the holy sites of St. Francis and then Rome to see Pope John Paul II. And then one of my friends insisted we go to San Giovanni Rotunda, and I was like, all right. So we took the trip down, and, and to be honest, you know, I mean, it was, it was nice. I, uh, let's see. This is, I saw the tomb. He hadn't been exhumed yet, his body. So this is the tomb with St. John Paul II at his tomb. His body has now been exhumed, and it's, it's on display. It's Pope Francis. And I got to even kiss some of the gloves that had the blood from his stigmata on them. But I wasn't... <laughs> Honestly, I was more impressed by the pizza in San Giovanni Rotunda. It was, it was some of the best pizza I'd ever had in Italy. And the town. So every evening in the town, the people, the whole town comes out and walks in a big circle around the town plaza. The whole town, kids, adults, everybody. There's an outer circle that walks one way, and there's an inner circle that walks the other way. And if you see someone you want to talk to, you just peel off and join their circle. It's just a wonderful experience of community. That's the main image I have. I walked in and we peeled off and like talked to some local Italians and the pizza was great and it was a great experience. But honestly, I don't remember the experience of Padre Pio that much, which is kind of strange to me because I grew up on the border of Mexico and I have a profound devotion to Our Lady of Guadalupe and I'm very pious in that regard. So I'm not sure what it is, but I knew I had to get over whatever it is I had against this man. So thank you, John. <laughs> so who was this man? Let's start with a brief biographical sketch before diving deeper. Francesco Forgioni, his name given at birth, was born on May 25th, 1887 in Pietrocina, small town in the boot of Italy. And you'll see above it San Giovanni Rotundo in the heel of the boot. Francesco wanted to join the Capuchin Franciscans at a young age, but they told him that he needed a better education, so his father, Orazio, moved to, immigrated to the United States. Uh, that's him on the left. We have no documentation, so possibly illegally. This was in 1987, 88, 97, 1897, 98 or so. And he stayed first in Pennsylvania for a while, and then in Queens, sending money home so that his son could get an education. In 1903, on his way to joining the Capuchins at the age of 16, Francesco had a significant vision, which he describes in the third person. And I thought we could read this together because it was very significant for him. So he's describing himself in the third person, having this vision. At his side, it's Francesco's, he beheld a majestic man of rare beauty, resplendent as the sun. This man took him by the hand and said, come with me, for you must fight a formidable warrior. A man appeared advancing so tall that his very forehead seemed to touch the heavens. The soul, that's Padre Pio, then turned to his God and begged him to spare him from the fury of that sinister being. He answered him, you must fight this man, 
Take heart, enter the combat with confidence. Go forth with courage, I shall be with you. He will continually renew the assault to regain his lost honor. Fight valiantly and do not doubt my aid. Keep your eyes wide open. Remember what I have promised you, that I will always succeed in conquering him. He understood that throughout his whole life, he would be engaged from this moment on in a profound spiritual battle with evil. And this internal battle would be the great feat of his life, a battle for his soul and a battle for the souls of those who came to see him. After entering the Franciscan Capuchins, he first went through the novitiate, a rigorous time of prayer, learning, and asceticism. While in the novitiate, he was known to be a practical jokester. It was very common at that time to have skulls around the house and not in novitiates as a reminder of your death. And because he knew this one particular novice was scared by the skull, he decided in the middle of the night to hide and make noises behind the skull so that the novice went screaming down the hallway. He deserved it. Pio was constantly plagued with illness while in studies, but no doctor ever came to a satisfactory diagnosis of what was wrong with him. In 1908, he was sent home to see if he would do better in his native air. He could eat nothing, and he vomited constantly. Throughout his life, his temperature regularly read up to 130 degrees, though that did not incapacitate him at all. He's a weird guy. <laughs> it was simply there, uh, and he said that this high temperature was always accompanied by profound, deep, profound experiences, inner experiences of the presence of Christ. Somehow he made it to ordination and was ordained a priest in Benevento on August 10th, 1910, at the age of 23. After ordination, he was sent to Naples a second time for medical examination, and all the doctors could discover was that he was hopelessly ill. So Pio was ordered to leave home and live in the convent of San Nicandro so that he could at least die in a monastery with Franciscans. It was here that many of his fellow monks began to notice his ecstasies and his holiness. He would regularly have visions of Mary, of Jesus, of St. Francis, of the devil, and of his guardian angel. His superior wanted to test whether his guardian angel really did communicate things to him. So he waited several times until Padre Pio was in an ecstasy in his room. And then he would go down the hallway and in his mind think, Padre Pio, I order you under holy obedience to come out of your trance. And Padre Pio would come out of the room and say, yes, Father, what do you need? <laughs> My guardian angel said you need me. So he communicated, he said, constantly with his guardian angel his whole life. From 1911 to 1916, Padre Pio remained in, the home, in his hometown of Pietrocina, since it was the only place where he wasn't plagued with illness. But it was also at this time that his reputation for holiness grew, especially as people began attending his masses. Finally, in the summer of 1916, Padre Pio invited his, uh, Padre Paolino invited his friend to spend a few nights at the newly opened friary of Our Lady of Grace which had just been refounded a few years earlier in San Giovanni Rotundo. He was to spend the rest of his life at this friary. He considered the greatest achievement of his life the, the opening of the house for the suffering, a house, uh, uh, a hospital, called for short La Casa. It was opened in 1954, and Pope Pius XII called it a magnificent success and gave Padre Pio complete control over its operations. <coughs> It was, and it remains, one of the best equipped hospitals in all of Italy. As Padre Pio loved to say, nothing is too good or too beautiful for the sick and for the suffering. Padre Pio lived in Our Lady of Grace Friary without leaving, except by by location, until his death in 1968. He was canonized a saint by St. John Paul II on June 16, 2002. So that's the basic story of Padre Pio. He was a simple, kind friar, a man of prayer and humility. He liked to laugh. He loved to tell jokes. He was stern in the confessional with hardened sinners and very gentle with everyone else. 
He was very abstemious in his eating habits, but he liked to drink a beer with lunch and hot chocolate at dinner. That's when I knew I liked him. <laughs> there was really very little that was externally special about this guy. But of course, that's the key, externally. Little of that biography gets at who Padre Pio really was. Padre Pio was a man who lived from the inside out in a most remarkable way. Most of us live our lives from the outside in, and that's why we're not saints. So this is a man we need to look at carefully. Several years ago, I was making an annual, my annual eight-day silent retreat that Jesuits make in New York City near the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I went every afternoon to meditate on religious art. And I was really taken by a picture of the stigmata of St. Francis of Assisi that follows one particular version of the story that says that when Francis got the stigmata, he got the nails as well in his hands and that these nails remained. I was very moved by this because I am often moved by meditating on the passion, but then that goes away and my love grows cold again. And I thought there was something very significant about this image of the nails remaining. There was something about the stigmata that still has the nail in the wounds. I, and what, what the Lord seemed to be communicating to me in prayer is that as long as the wounds of Christ's love remain open in us, then we can show his love to the world, but that these wounds can only remain open as long as we let the nails that Christ gives us remain in them. Now, for me, the nails are my vows as a religious of poverty and chastity and obedience. These are the nails. When I let these have their bite, when I feel the pain of these, I am able to show, to show love. They're like nails that keep me bleeding with the love of Christ. And for many of you, these are the vows that you gave to one another in marriage or the vocations you have that the Lord communicates to you as a student. These are the nails whose bite you have to feel, right, on a daily basis because these, these wounds that Christ gives us of our calling is what makes us into whiz, uh, windows of his divine love. I think that Christ does not fail to offer to each of us the means of being united to his passion and conformed to the kind of love that he revealed on the cross. But to leave the nails in, that's the hard part, to leave the nails in. Most of us cling to a life of comfort, but Christ continually offers us two choices, a life conformed to passion, to comfort and convenience, or a life conformed to his passion, a life of self-sacrificial love. And those are really our only two choices. So what is remarkable, I think, about Padre Pio is that he consistently chose the second option. And that this choice was reflected from the inside out in the marks of Christ's cross that he received on his body. These marked externally what was already the case internally, that he had united himself to Christ on the cross. That is who Padre Pio was. That is why people often waited weeks on end to go to confession to him or to see his masses. They knew they were going to encounter Christ. The story of Padre Pio's stigmata is quite remarkable. On September 7th, 1910, at the age of 23, about a month after his ordination, fiery red spots appeared for the first time on his hands. Padre Pio told his superior that Jesus and Mary had given them to him while he was praying. His superior said, go see a doctor. <laughs> the doctor said, well, you have tuberculosis of the hands. He went to another doctor who vehemently rejected that diagnosis and wrote up that he saw on both sides of Padre Pio's hands a half-inch diameter wound in exactly the same spot. Padre Pio was very embarrassed 
by this. And so he went back to his superior and said, will you pray with me that the Lord remove these? So they prayed and they were removed until exactly one year later, they returned again, this time also on his feet. Then on August 5th, 1918, while in prayer, Padre Pio experienced the transverberation or piercing of his heart. And this is how he describes it. I was filled with terror at the sight of a heavenly being. He held some kind of weapon in his hand, something like a long, sharp-pointed steel blade. I saw that mighty being hurl the weapon into my soul with all his might. It was only with great difficulty that I did not cry out. I thought I was dying. This agony lasted uninterruptedly until the morning of the seventh. That was for three days. From that day on, I have been mortally wounded. I feel in the depths of my soul a wound that is always open and causes me continual agony. Just over a month later, on September 20th, he saw this great mysterious being once again. This time, the being was dripping blood from his hands, his feet, and his side. And Padre Pio heard a voice that said, I unite you now to my passion. And when Padre Pio came out of his trance, he too was dripping blood from his hands, his feet, and still from his side. Padre Pio is the first priest to ever receive the stigmata and the only person to receive them in modern times such that they could be subjected to frequent testing and analysis. Although very recently on October 13th with St. John Henry Newman, an Indian nun, Mariam Shiramel, was also canonized, uh, and she had the stigmata, but she died before he did in 1926. So he's the most modern stigmatist that has been able to be studied. Early on, five different physicians examined Padre Pio's wounds including Pope Benedict XV's own physician. By 1925, the Vatican forbade Padre Pio to show them to anyone, even physicians, although when he was being treated for other illnesses later in life, many doctors did get a very good look. Padre Parente, Padre Pio's helper when he was older, several times got a good look at the wounds when Padre Pio had to change his gloves every night and his nightshirt, which was frequently covered in blood. They were three quarters of an inch in diameter, usually covered by a scab. When the scab came off, the wounds would ooze blood. Most doctors agreed that the wounds did not pierce through the entire hand, but that they were very deep. On particular days during Lent, Padre Pio would also bleed profusely from his torso, suggesting the scourging of Christ. And this is how his, his, um, his nightshirt would look in the morning. Dr. Bignami, who was a religious skeptic, suggested three possibilities. First, Padre Pio voluntarily created the wounds with carbolic acid or with some other solution. Or they were the result of a morbid state, or they were a combination of both. At one, once in 1920, Padre Pio did secretly request carbolic acid for the monastery. He said he needed their carbolic acid to sterilize syringes because of the uh, high fever that was going around, the sickness that was going around the area. And some have used that single fact to claim that he used carbolic acid for 50 years to create the stigmata. So Dr. Bignami recommended a procedure to heal the wounds. All chemicals were confiscated from his room. All they found was iodine. Then his hands, his feet, and his chest were carefully bandaged and securely sealed in the presence of witnesses, and every morning reopened in the presence of witnesses so that Padre Pio would not, in the middle of the night, be able to reopen his wounds. Dr. Bignami expected that the wounds would begin to heal rather quickly now that Padre Pio was not opening them again every night, which is what he assumed. In fact, at the end of eight days, the wounds were bleeding more heavily than ever. When it was suggested to Padre Pio that he caused the stigmata by mentally obsessing over the passion, he said, go out to the fields and look for a bull. Look very closely at him. Concentrate with all your might and see if you start growing horns. <laughs> <laughs> he 
Here are some of the pictures of the stigmata. They were most visible during mass because during mass is when he would take the wound, uh, the gloves off of his hands. You can see, I mean, they're, they're heavily crusted over with blood. It's kind of a close-up look. The Holy Office of the Inquisition, now called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, sent a visitor in 1921. He noted in particular that the wounds never became inflamed like they would have if they had been the result of disease. He was also one of many to observe first that they gave off a very strong and pleasant smell, like the smell of roses and violets. His report concluded, I'm not an admirer of the Padre, but he is a good religious, exemplary in the practice of the virtues. He shines especially because of his sincere humility. One of the most notable things about the stigmata was this aroma of paradise. Actually, it's one of probably the most commonly known supernatural feature attributed to Padre Pio. People smelled this aroma of roses whenever they were near him, or when he appeared to them, or when they simply knew that he was in the room. The first miracle approved for his beatification involved the healing of two large lumps filled with lymphatic fluid on Consiglia de Martino's neck. After praying to Padre Pio, her husband smelled the typical intense perfume of his presence, and her tumors immediately disappeared. For Padre Pio, this aroma was a sign of the sweetness of the passion of the Lord. For him, sharing in the passion of Christ was not some morbid thing. It was Christ's opportunity to share, it was his opportunity to share the sweetness of Christ to the world. By 1968, the year of his death, the stigmata were disappearing. For more than a year, they had been gone from his feet. He was now 81 years old. By that summer, only scabs remained, and his helper explained it this way. The ministry was finished, so the signs were finished. As he was dying, Padre Pio no longer attempted to hide his hands. But everyone observed that there were no scars on them whatsoever. Nothing to mark the fact that there had been a wound there for over 50 years. Ten minutes after his death on September 22, 1968, Dr. Sala gave this report. The hands, feet, and trunk and every other part of the body showed no traces of wounds, nor were there scars present on hand or foot, neither on the front or the back, nor on the heel, nor on the side, where in life there had been visible and well-demarcated wounds. The skin in those places was the same as that in every other part of the body, and the pressure of the fingers showed no evidence of a depression in the skin or subcutaneous tissue, nor a displacement of the bones or recession of either. The appearance, the color, the consistency revealed nothing in particular, nor the presence of signs of previous incisions, lacerations, cuts, wounds, or inflammatory reactions. To me, this is quite remarkable. So what does all of this have to do with Padre Pio as a saint of the Eucharist? Padre Pio, as I said, lived from the inside out. Many of us live from the outside in, especially in our growing attention culture, demanding constantly our attention. We, we live as a response to external stimuli. But this was not the case for Padre Pio. His interior life of conformity to the passion of Christ gradually became manifested on the outside in his body. But it came from the inside, from the Eucharistic form that his body had taken on. His body became a visible symbol of the sacrifice of the Mass. Padre Pio's Masses were what first drew people to him. From the earliest years of his priesthood, they took up to two or three hours. And yet, people kept attending. More and more people were attending. They weren't concerned about Sunday afternoon football or missing their tea time. During the two years when Padre Pio was completely silenced by the Vatican, between 1931 and 33, because of the complete tumult created around him, and the Vatican did not allow him to say Mass, hear confessions, or anything, or even to appear in public, during that time, his Masses were regularly up to four hours long. 
Some especially powerful witnesses to Padre Pio's masses are the American soldiers who got to know him during World War II. In January of 1943, William Kerrigan, an Iowa native who had taught psychology at Catholic University, <coughs> arrived in southern Italy. He heard about a monk living in the mountains who had the wounds of Christ. So he got together 20 American soldiers, and they made the trek to San Giovanni Rotondo on a cold, snowy day. They arrived in the middle of Mass. Kerrigan remembered the experience vividly. Padre Pio shifted from one foot to the other as if he were in great pain. At the consecration, he seemed to take on the physical sufferings of Christ. He shouted the words, this is my body, biting off the words as if he were in tremendous pain. When he reached for the chalice, he jerked his hand back violently as if the pain were so great he couldn't grasp it. Tears rolled down his cheeks. After the consecration, the suffering seemed to subside, and Padre Pio seems exhausted, spending a long moment in meditation, just leaning on the altar. After Mass, Kerrigan kissed Pio's hands and smelled the pleasant aroma that he thought must have been some kind of medication. Padre Pio loved the Americans, and they loved him. This is him with a group of American soldiers. Kerrigan said that Pio felt like the kind of guy you could go fishing with. Another American soldier, Joe Peluso, got to eat dinner with the friars. Peluso's, he's one of these, I'm not sure which one he is, meeting with Padre Pio. And he said that Padre Pio was so funny that in his words, the friars at dinner were going bananas at his jokes. <laughs> that some of them actually had to leave the room because they were laughing so hard. Mario Avignone, another American, was assigned to the headquarters of the 304th Bomb Wing of the 15th Air Force. He describes his experience of Padre Pio's Mass. The Mass lasted almost two hours. It was a Mass I could not describe. The room was filled with a perfume that came from Padre Pio's wounds. As I knelt next to the altar, I could clearly see the suffering Padre Pio was going through from the pain in his wounds. He made painful expressions all during Mass, never noticing anyone in the church. I had the sense that he was physically here, but spiritually with Christ at the foot of the altar, of the cross. At times he wept with tears running down his face. He was actually living the passion of our Lord. When he raised his hands, I could clearly see the painful looking wounds on his hands. Father John St. John S.J., a young 35-year-old Jesuit military chaplain, also met Padre Pio. He would take soldiers who wanted to make a little road trip up to San Giovanni Rotundo if they wanted to see him. On one particular visit, Padre Pio asked Father St. John if he knew a particular sergeant. Father St. John said he did not. Padre Pio said he's in the second bomb group. And Father St. John said, well, uh, I don't know him. And Padre Pio said, well, I have a message for him. Tell him his baby was born yesterday and his wife and baby are doing fine. <laughs> Father St. John found the sergeant and asked him if he knew who Padre Pio was. The man said he did not. So Father St. John told him what Padre Pio had said. His wife was, in fact, expecting, and two days later he found out that his wife had given birth to a little girl on the day that Father P Padre Pio had said. This is what was most remarkable to Father St. John. was remarkable, but most remarkable, he's always said, was how Padre Pio said Mass. Outside of Mass, he was a happy man with a nice chuckle, nice, bright eyes. But at Mass, he seemed to be in ecstasy. At the consecration, holding the host up, he seemed to be out of this world. He seemed not to know where he was. His eyes were aglow. People often spoke about the power of Padre Pio's eyes, how much they glowed, but never so much as during the consecration. Padre Pio often gained weight the most while he was fasting and only eating the Eucharist. <laughs> when his doctor asked him about this, he said, well, we have to think about the parable in the Bible about the sower. The grain fell on good ground and produced a hundredfold. You see, doctor, my soil is good. 
so it can produce much <laughs> with just a little. Everything depends on assimilation. So as we close, the question I would like to ask ourselves, like us to ask ourselves, is what would it look like if I were to allow myself to be so conformed to the passion of the Lord as Padre Pio? Isn't that possible for me? Everyone who met the man says there was nothing special about his personality. There was definitely nothing special about his education. He was a kind, cheerful human being. But he was a kind, cheerful human being who had let the Eucharist transform him from the inside out. From his ordination forward, he assimilated the Eucharist, and he was assimilated to the Eucharist. He became one with Christ. And because he assimilated the crucified Lord into himself, gradually, from the inside out, eventually manifested in his stigmata, Padre Pio became a living icon of God's love. So why can't that happen to me and to you? Is there something else that is too important in our lives? What could be more important than letting the Eucharist transform me into an icon of Christ's crucified love? Am I too busy studying, making money, preparing for or having a comfortable retirement? Am I too busy going to Notre Dame football games? <laughs> None of these things really, really matter. Padre Pio, I think, is so remarkable because he clearly and simply, simply shows us what matters. He spent his whole life in a small town in southern Italy, never leaving his monastery. And look at the impact he has had. He teaches us that what matters is union with Christ, and that is all. But this involves crucifixion and suffering, because continually reflecting divine love is a painful thing. It's a really painful thing. It means we have to leave the nails of our vocation firmly intact. It clashes with the selfishness of the world and the selfishness in my own heart. With our desire for comfort, it's hard to remain faithful to this calling, something Padre Pio never had. He was never comfortable. Think about having these wounds all the time, without stop, constantly. It kept him from ever being comfortable so that he was always seeking the Lord. This is not easy, but I think that Padre Pio, this living icon of Christ's crucified love, shows us how to do this joyfully. And I invite us today to follow his example. Thank you. <laughs>